Yeah, I think uh, we have enough people to start. So um, yeah, this is me, Slava, and I'm going to, to uh, do a presentation about uh, my personal fight uh, uh, with the help of a uh, community that I'm involved uh, against uh, coronavirus. Now, yeah, let me go to presenter mode. Okay, so first of all, uh, for me, Evan started quite a long time ago. I was already worried about the situation in, in China in the end of last year. And uh, basically, uh, I thought that it's going to be quite a big problem for the whole world. And uh, when it came to Europe, I started to collect uh, data on uh, coronavirus uh, in March. And uh, I've created data hub on Harvard Dataverse. And uh, I started to uh, search for data. And apparently, I found there are no data uh, available as open data in this uh, fairness. So I decided to uh, archive those data and actually to uh, uh, to get everything in one hub. So I've created this uh, hub on Harvard Dataverse, and now it's up to date. And basically, uh, every day uh, I'm just archiving new data. So after I've got a lot of data, uh, I thought, well, I need to do something with uh, processing and an analysis. So this is why I thought it would be nice to find someone who is also interested and uh, to join some community and to do it together. So. My motivation was quite simple. Um, well, of course, everybody knows I'm from Ukraine, but, but uh, I, I see myself as raised as, as a scientist in Netherlands. Uh, and uh, I saw a lot of uh, cases during my career here that people just refused to collaborate together. And uh, they uh, actually um, thought that probably their own ambitions much more higher than uh, actually to, to start to do, to produce something uh, in, in this open collaboration and uh, to share some knowledge. So uh, I also th thought it would be nice actually to get uh, people from different countries involved uh, in this uh, analysis of uh, COVID-19 data because uh, we need to do it together, all countries basically affected by, by coronavirus. So uh, yeah, you can hear my motivation here and uh, this is what I posted on Slack and uh, yeah. Uh, this is just uh, part of my story. Uh, I was also uh, affected by coronavirus personally. I spent seven weeks in complete lockdown in Spain in, uh, in the apartment and uh, it was not allowed to go outside for me and my family at all. So just difficult times. So I perfectly understand what coronavirus is and uh, how it's affecting uh, society. So here you can see a really nice Spanish song that became kind of anthem of a fight against coronavirus. It's called Resistere. I will resist and I really advise you to, uh, I will share the slides and I really advise you to listen to this song because uh, from it I've got the idea what actually I want to do. I want to do it like uh, together, like, like with music musicians from this video. They played one song basically using Zoom or go to meeting like they're doing now. And they actually did it together. So uh, at some point I found a very interesting community. It just started to form uh, in the end of March. And uh, uh, a lot of people from different countries uh, just came together and most of them had uh, artificial intelligence background and they decided, okay, let, let, let's do something together. and. Uh, Let's try to figure out how, how to fight against uh, COVID-19 uh, spread and uh, how actually uh, we can help uh, medical community to find uh, some cure or some vaccine uh, and uh, investigate other possibilities to help them. So I joined uh, CoronaVi and uh, now it's a, a really big community with more than 1,000 people. and uh, It stated 1,066, but, but actually we already have like uh, almost one one thousand and one hundred uh, people in this community, and it's growing really fast because we are producing some things that uh, actually want to show you in this presentation. So, after for this community started from uh, COVID nineteen open research uh, dataset challenge. At some point, uh, White House already uh, was worried uh, about spread of coronavirus in the United States, and it was clear that. Uh, 
it will not uh, going away. So they decided to open some papers uh, about COVID-19 and uh, uh, there is uh, actually a consortium uh, with uh, Allen um, Artificial Intelligence Institute and uh, other partners like Microsoft and uh, Amazon and Google involved. So what they did actually, they queried uh, different medical databases and they collected uh, over uh, 52 uh, papers on COVID-19 uh, related to uh, coronavirus uh, and um, similar viruses. So uh, in Corona One community, uh, because a lot of people came together, so they, they decided, okay, let, let's uh, just uh, decide, uh, let's decide what kind of tasks we can do from uh, this challenge. And uh, basically, uh, all all uh, data sets, uh, all, all papers were published as open data set on Kaggle website. So uh, there are different teams that just created uh, like bottom up and uh, like first team is uh, task risk and uh, they wanted to identify all risk factors uh, like smoking, uh, how it's actually increasing the chance to be uh, uh, infected by coronavirus. And uh, there is also task ties that export transmission incubation and uh, environment stability and uh, more common tasks like, like name entity recognition and uh, medical entities recognition uh, from uh, entire corpus of COVID-19 and uh, also clinical trials and uh, literature or visualization uh, tools. This is something that this community start, started to do and uh, uh, we, it's really a global community. So we have all time zones and people coming from all continents together. And uh, basically when I joined, I started to lead uh, labs and common data and services efforts uh, for the whole community. So this is something that uh, yeah, got produced. Uh, so we, we had few uh, data visualization uh, experts in, in this community and uh, they just started to ask people uh, what new they uh, extracted, what kind of insights they got, and uh, they did processing of all information and they created this kind of Power BI dashboards. So this specific dashboard was created by uh, Mike Honey from Australia and uh, there are different dashboards for uh, all tasks basically available. And we're trying to keep it up to date also. Oh, I'm sorry. Something happened. Uh, this is my computer. I'm really sorry for that. Yeah, I will go back. Okay. Yes, next. So, um, you might think that uh, uh, work in these uh, open communities like that. So, you, you can see windmill somewhere in the sea and you just need to catch a wind and uh, everything is, is running smoothly uh, there are no conflicts and uh, so basically it's kind kind of harmony but in reality it's like that so you can you can think about like like sheep and uh, uh, there is storm and uh, lightnings and uh, yeah different uh, things are coming from different sides so it's always like uh, a lot of people discussing in principle the same thing that they should agree on do some uh, to do something together but in reality of course we have a lot of opinions and it's difficult to agree on something so it's not really easy to uh, manage this uh, community with 1000 people so there are some rules that uh, i've got from uh, management of uh, high scale open source project like corona y and basically uh, what you should understand uh, and this is what all people uh, feel we are running like mad in all directions in the same time and uh, stuck in in a perfect state of entropy and we don't know what will happen next there are so many people with crazy ideas and uh, it can change any time basically even during one day so it's an uh, incredible dynamic and uh, i've never faced something like that before to be honest so my second rule just if you will join uh, this kind of community you should forget about all your previous experience and uh, nothing really works here and i have i had experience with uh, product uh, development and uh, customer methodology development uh, model 
but it's something completely different. Open source is something that you never faced before. <laughs> Trust me. So uh, I already told you that people with a different motivation, uh, yeah, they don't like to be pushed. So because they're joining as volunteers, this own uh, ideas and motivation, and they want to get something for themselves from this uh, open collaboration. So a kind of fight or war can, can start anytime. And uh, sometimes it's necessary to play kind of judge role, actually to put all people in, in different corners that uh, started this, this kind of fights. And uh, when people are joining because they don't know each other, uh, most of them just acting like uh, lone wolves. And after they're just reading what's going on and uh, uh, just watching uh, YouTube videos uh, that we are producing, they're joining teams, but this is just like for more advanced people that really want to do something together. And uh, another thing that uh, is really fascinating about this community, the great leaders inside of, uh, of teams, they can attract uh, people and they can actually uh, create kind of uh, internal uh, hum uh, human resources crisis that everybody wants to work uh, for them. And it means that other people uh, in other teams uh, well, we'll, we'll basically will lose because there are no, not enough resources. So we also we are trying to manage this in, in, in like a proper way. We are trying to find interested people and uh, do onboarding for these, these kind of tasks. So but but it's it's quite difficult also. And uh, another thing, because we have people from like a lot of countries. So, of course, there are also international relations uh, problems. And, uh, you know, we have, I, I don't want to uh, actually to name some nations, but uh, sometimes we have kind of problems with, because we have different opinions and different vision, how things should be done. So we are trying to kind of separate them and uh, to uh, form these teams in, in like in more harmonic way. And the most important thing that for all people that join this community, uh, we're trying to find commons, some commons. And if people not uh, able to find commons, of course, they should uh, leave right now because it, it will poison uh, this community. So uh, we started to look for some examples, actually, how we can, we can manage this uh, efficiently. And uh, what we found, uh, uh, there is an uh, example of uh, Valve Corporation, and uh, this is a game producer, one of the most famous uh, game producers. And uh, they actually uh, created kind of a very interesting hierarchy. Basically, there is no hierarchy. There are no bosses at all. And all employers uh, can choose a project that they're interested. And uh, uh, so basically, uh, they can start to work together and the only requirement they should take responsibility on the result they're producing and we think that it's probably uh, very close to what we're doing in, in this open community so uh, there are some some uh, rules of people management because we also do people management uh, in this open source project uh, so people uh, don't want to be directed and support uh, they want to be directed and supported by not managed and pushed so it's a it's a very common situation when people come into community and they, are, they already have some ideas what they want to do and they started to create teams but team is crashing after some time because uh, they think it's too authoritative way of uh, expressing things and uh, they don't want to follow this so also uh, it's very important to understand uh, the motivation because uh, volunteering job of course is, is kind of so it's it's considered a self-test so for example junior people can uh, come to this community and can can play kind of senior roles and postgraduate students can can try to lead project and senior uh, people can can become uh, a mentor for uh, other teams so this is like you're coming and you're trying to do things on high level and this is important to understand uh, because it's it's uh, important for their motivation. And uh, we are trying to support all volunteers. Uh, so we, we have kind of like advisory board and we are trying to support all people with advices and uh, we're providing all resources. Uh, we are also, uh, because uh, we also got uh, some resources from Google and Amazon. So we can create like dedicated virtual machines 
and uh, we can provide uh, resources to our infrastructure, which which is coming in my uh, next slides. So uh, in this open community, people come and live in, and uh, our idea that uh, we need to let them to contribute their best to this open community before actually they left. And uh, this is kind of important uh, for uh, this development because uh, if we'll not get immediately people involved in some things that are interested for them, of course, they're, they're going to lose them uh, very quickly. So from this point of view, Coronavai uh, community can be seen as like huge incubator and uh, we don't want to actually to stop any ideas. And we are considering even crazy ideas uh, to be valuable at some point. And probably uh, these kind of ideas can, can actually bring like creative and innovative uh, solution of our problem to find some, some kind of cure or even vaccine against uh, um, coronavirus. So there are some lessons. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to a famous essay uh, called The Cathedral and Bazaar. And uh, here you can see, uh, yeah, there are like common things for open source projects. It's, uh, it's starting from uh, every good work of software starts by scratching a developer's per per uh, personal itch. So this is just must have. Developer or person sh should find some some requirements and uh, to help himself at first point and also it's about reusability so we all know that uh, yeah developers uh, can produce some, some code but it's difficult for other people to understand what it does and uh, actually to reuse so we are trying to support it also but in the same time we, we understand that uh, this code can be thrown thro thro thrown away anytime so this is why we came uh, these concepts of uh, uh, running uh, everything as labs. And uh, in, in this community, people actually have a uh, right to make mistakes. So we are not punishing ev anyone for making like crazy moves or creating own team. Uh, it's uh, probably, it's, it's a good thing that people can, can just go in, in a lot of directions if they would like to go there. So uh, we are ready to, uh, to actually to throw away any time that something that people will consider as useless. So another thing that uh, we're actually uh, trying to release often, so there are like everyday uh, updates in uh, Coronavai GitHub. And we are also collecting all the feedback from people just, just uh, reusing the, the same software. And now I'm coming to uh, really interesting points uh, and it's related, highly re re related to what dance actually does so this is true for data management smart data structures and dumb code works a lot better than the other way around and i saw this in a lot of cases in a lot of projects and it seems to be like like really a way to go because first you should put all data in in like a proper way uh, this uh, all metadata and in fair way uh, exposed and after you can write uh, some code and if you will create a really nice software with documentation but uh, your data will be uh, stored god knows, god knows there and uh, it will be not described well so you will lose everything basically after some time because it will be not maintainable and yeah now we're coming to a second rule uh, related to data we should not actually throw away any data we don't have uh, right to disturb uh, the data stream uh, and we should do it as little as possible only if uh, people responsible for this data will ask us and this is i think also quite important so if you know uh, there is uh, of course uh, linux torvalds with his uh, linux uh, idea and uh, how he's managing uh, linux community is quite uh, fascinating and it's a big inspiration for us so in next slide uh I've, next slides i will try to show you that probably it's necessary to have kind of benevolent uh, di di dictator for life and this kind of communities uh, will not uh, survive if a person like like that will be not involved so you can see uh this is basically our landscape we have 1000 people and people do some something we don't know what 
in a lot of cases uh, they can work independently they can use their own github so it's not clear what they do but uh, there are some uh, connection points so we, we did analysis of uh, channels on slack and basically we, we found that uh, there are some things like, like common so for example the discussions about where to get data and how to get uh, up-to-date data where to store data all these discussions uh, you can see clusterized in, in this uh, chart and because we have a lot of people we decided okay let, let's do analysis of all skills that we have in community so it's a very impressive picture because uh, we have uh, more than 600 skills filled by people uh, during uh, registration and now the idea that uh, you know we need to manage it somehow efficiently we, we, we need to find some way how to appoint how to actually uh, move people to a specific team that probably uh, will be better for them so we started to uh, look at the CRM uh, open source software and uh, there is a system called vTiger and we got only uh, all uh, people imported in this system uh, this uh, anonymization, anonymization so there is no, no possibility to get names uh, directly from this service and this is very very nice dashboard because it actually allows uh, to group leaders uh, to go there to this interface and select people that probably can match uh, to execute their tasks and uh, because we are doing everything with uh, respect to gdpr of course names of people not uh, exposed to this dashboard so it's uh, really anonymized so they don't know from where actually person is coming and who is this person but they can just select some people that probably can do something uh, useful for them and after this volunteers can be contacted by uh, task, le uh, task leaders and invited to participate in their tasks and in some cases they uh, actually uh, they, they are denying to join a uh, task but, but mostly our experience shows that uh, people really you know they want to, to learn new things so they want to try to be involved in, in a in a lot of tasks in the same time just to see what will happen and uh, of course for us it's, it's a kind of challenge because uh, we need to align all time zones and we also have this information in, in this uh, dashboard and of course it should be transparent and clear for uh, task leaders and for all people that like working together so um, now we have like comments for uh, task leaders and volunteers and uh, we started Baba. Baba, yes. there, there was a question in the in the in the chat of Yuke. what do you mean by comments okay so i will try to explain on this is exactly this slide right uh, so we are using uh, harvard data comments and this is something that uh, harvard university is actually supporting and uh, trying to build this uh, model and uh, develop it further so basically you can think about uh, research tools and uh, these research tools connected to data repository and computing resources and storage right so nothing new here but in the way how uh, we see it uh, so there are some things that are common for everything and uh, basically uh, this is data right so all uh, groups they are working on they're producing something and uh, they have to store their, their data because probably for other group for other task their data can be kind of uh, input or can be just important can, can be also reused so it's really important to keep data uh, in a good state and uh, this persistency and uh, after to build something on top of this data so dataverse is like a perfect example because you can get data in you can get data out both manually and uh, with using tool, uh, tools so there is really nice automatic support and you can keep all the revisions and versions of software so and also you can keep provenance information so basically uh, you can get the understanding who is responsible for every data point and if something goes wrong you can always uh, contact this person and ask uh, how they did that and why they did that and uh, yeah something like that so yeah so this is our 
Coronavirus Dataverse, and uh, of course, uh, I used a lot of work that we did for uh, European projects. And uh, basically, there are some parts uh, coming uh, from Shock Dataverse, and uh, something was developed as part of, say, the uh, uh, Dataverse EU project. So the idea that uh, Dataverse will become a central integration point for all teams and individual contributors. And this is kind of basis of what we do. And I already mentioned that there is there is possibility to get data uh, both manually and automatically. So we managed to integrate uh, Jupyter notebooks that people are using uh, by Data Access API and uh, this Py Dataverse that was developed in Shock Project. Actually, they are able to do any kind of uh, data manipulation and uh, run um, all Jupyter notebooks uh, to be connected in up-to-date uh, data sets. Uh, so all data points actually synchronized with services that we started to build on top. And the most important thing that all people that are working uh, in CoronaVi, they can get uh, acknowledgement. So we don't want to steal any other's work. Uh, we are actually asking people to put their names in, in data sets that they're producing. And in this example, you can see it's a really long list of people that used to work on the same data set. And uh, basically, we ask them to put the same list also in GitHub, and there is documentation available, and also they started to produce uh, articles. Uh, so it's really like collaborative effort. So um, at some point, I thought, OK, uh, people already working with Dataverse, and what we can do more. So um, I, uh, with the help of other volunteers, I extended functionality of Dataverse and I created a kind of uh, Google crawler. So now we are crawling uh, GitHub and other websites uh, where people actually hosting their own data, but uh, in not fair way. And what we do, we are just harvesting data and we are uh, trying to find and recognize uh, tabular data. And we are getting all, uh, all this data imported to Dataverse. So, uh, after first experiment, we got like uh, 5,000 uh, coronavirus-related tabular files in one dataverse, in, like after three days. And at the moment, uh, we already have, I think, like 100,000. Of course, not everything should be exposed and published because there are some uh, sensitive data. This is why uh, we are doing uh, curation manually. And the further idea actually to reuse tools that we're developing as part of this infrastructure, actually to uh, to do harmonization of the old data sets to recognize all variables and to, to get variables linked to the knowledge graph. So basically all data that we are trying to, uh, we're, that we are harvesting should be automatically connected to knowledge graph and uh, people can just connect to their uh, tools. Uh, let's say Jupyter Notebook and to uh, enrich their own data with some new information. So this is very important step to apply uh, machine learning to this and uh, with help of human curators, we can get much more uh, powerful uh, tools uh, and also data frames. And everything should be interlinked in, in one data frame. So now I'm coming to the point uh, where uh, it became too big and it was already uh, clear that this way is kind of, uh, it's not going to work because we have too much. So I created another team that uh, does verification of uh, all these uh, variables uh, by hands, right? And uh, this example, how they do so, there is a data set that was harvested and uh, we extracted all variables. They, they, uh, we did verification and all content actually imported in data frame. And all column names uh, became part of um, uh, metadata as well. So you can see from uh, uh, after every technical metadata, you can see all labels like patients uh, diseased and uh, patients in hospital and other things. So it's really, uh, it's visually clear what is inside of every variable. And uh, for, for a lot of people, uh, because they are looking for this kind of data, they can immediately go to Dataverse, uh, get uh, API uh, request to specific file, and they can import in their uh, uh, Jupyter notebook, and they can start to do something with those data, right? 
and also to make it even more uh, simple, we activated all data previewers that we developed in Cesda and Shock project. And uh, now there is content available even without uh, download. So like a spreadsheet, you can just click on file and you can see the content without actually downloading the, the, uh, the content file. So um, at some point I thought, okay, it's a nice concept. So we have a lot of labels and uh, let's create like internal challenge like Kegel does. And we, uh, we decided to build machine learning models to classify all this metadata. So for example, this data set, it can be also classified as in some category that uh, we have in, in inside of CoronaVi and we will try to do that uh, like next weeks or next months. So uh, I already told you about a uh, data management team that I created. And uh, at some point uh, it's, it was clear that only uh, Google style uh, where we are just harvesting all data is not going to work. It's quite uh, difficult to understand what's going on. So uh, the idea that I had, uh, I started to think about kind of crowdsourcing tool. So uh, we implemented this uh, like mixed pipeline. So first we're getting a data set uh, imported in Dataverse. And after uh, the data management team is just choosing some data set that seems to be important or they contain new information and they're approaching uh, GitHub owners uh, and they're creating issues. And they're actually inviting them to uh, participate and uh, to take responsibility to curate their own data that we have. And if they don't want to, uh, they can just uh, ask us to delete this data set. There is no, also not, uh, not, not, not a problem at all. So uh, surprisingly, more than 20% of uh, data owners, uh, we are interested in joining a community and uh, they're actually going to curate their own data sets. And this is kind of lesson that I've got that, uh, you know, if you are providing something interesting to people, if you are helping them to expose their data, so their data will become reused by other groups or other people, this is what actually people want to, to uh, see and uh, they will be happy to join this kind of collaboration because together we much much more stronger than just one guy just doing something this uh, public data on coronavirus so uh, this bottom-up data collection really works and i think this is what people uh, running as data repositories also should do after some time because uh, now we have a lot of data sets that just published somewhere and uh, we don't know what kind of information inside and only data, uh, only data owners can, can tell us what is inside, right? So uh, now I'm coming to um, CoronaVi Common Research and Data Infrastructure that I started to build. So first, uh, of course, it's uh, Dataverse. I already talked quite a lot about uh, how we're using Dataverse to uh, support both automatic and curated workflows but also because we got a lot of papers uh, from uh, Core 19, this data set published by uh, Allen AI. So uh, we decided to uh, actually to uh, build pre-processing pipeline that can get uh, all entities from uh, papers and uh, can get, get uh, those entities linked to their medical ontologies. And uh, also there are other things that support in this process. So there is Elasticsearch deployed in our infrastructure and uh, there are uh, medical indexes already available like MESH or uh, other UMLS. And uh, also we have GeoNames index that allows to track uh, back all locations that we have in papers and also grid database, which, is, uh, which contains uh, all affiliations uh, of all institutions worldwide. Other thing, we are running a uh, hypothesis in annotation service, uh, and I have complete, uh, the whole slide about hypothesis because it's very important service, and it allows actually to annotate uh, um, all papers that we have, and of course it's not possible to do it without knowledge graph. So we have uh, Virtuoso, and we have some some public uh, GraphQL endpoints to query this knowledge graph. And other services that important is Colab, and uh, we also uh, provide the MongoDB access if people want to use uh, some some kind of uh, storage. Uh, and uh, there is also Kibana uh, dashboard for Elasticsearch, and we also implemented Bell Commons uh, and Indra and GeoParser. So there are a lot of things that. Uh, 
interesting and i'm going to tell you what exactly we do after this slide so the idea that we are building this uh, horizontal infrastructure that can support any kind of tasks and um, uh, um, it's about um, how vertical teams can be scaled up, right? So we have uh, currently like, like 10 vertical teams and uh, we can get much more because uh, we are providing shared resources. And uh, you can see from this picture, uh, everybody has kind of own wor wor workflow that can be also reused by other group. So this is really an interesting approach because it's scaling up uh, endlessly. We can add any kind of task to it and people can just reuse the same services or the same data. So uh, there are some key points of this infrastructure management. And uh, first of all, a lot of uh, tools that are in, still in, in the experimental state. So there is no production version. So we are adding labs in, in their subdomain names. And uh, like, like Herbert uh, said in, during previous pre presentation, it's kind of fluid uh, data infrastructure. So if we think that nobody will use some service, we can just stop it and uh, we can basically forget about it, right? And if we'll see that people really interested in, in some specific service, they are, uh, we are working on, on deployment on Kubernetes. So basically they are helping uh, uh, owners of uh, or developers of specific tools that we are using, we are helping to increase maturity and uh, we're creating continuous integration pipelines for them and after some time uh, we want them actually to get all these uh, contributions and also to be integrated in their repository and the most uh, the most important that every member of uh, this community can get access to virtual machines and uh, they can request and build uh, their application and they can invite people to test it and they can suggest to us to run it as an infrastructure uh, component after they think it will be ready. So uh, there is uh, like one of the examples that is uh, coll collab service and it's kind of Google collab. But what we did actually, we tried to find a solution that uh, allows to do it, uh, to do uh, like uh, collaboration in teams. So there is a service that deployed uh, somewhere in the cloud and people can, can just get a common token and they can just work uh, on the same notebook and they can correct some things they can fix some bugs uh, so it's really nice for collaborative work and uh, basically we are getting all tasks in in one collab so it's also very important for new people coming to us they can get onboarding instructions so they can open this collab service and they can see what people are actually working on and uh, what kind of tasks actually require uh, uh, so some special intention and where they can actually join, right? So now I'm coming back to Core 19 preprocessing pipeline. Uh, so this is just example how it operates. So if there is some text from uh, from paper about COVID-19, it does uh, entity recognition and uh, uh, all these entities uh, they can be linked to their concept idea. And this information we already have in Elastic. So there is uh, Alin AI Spacey pipeline, and they did training of uh, this model on medical uh, sources. And we are currently using this in pipeline, but but we can extend with any kind of uh, customized models after some time. And this is how it looks like. So there is a sentence, and uh, there are some lemmas extracted, and you can see MLS which is uh, medical ontology and uh, UMLS IDS and also some vectors. So this data processing pipeline does entity linking and uh, name entity recognition and uh, all dependencies. So we found a lot of common problems that the uh, preprocessing pipeline can extract uh, text only from some entities, but not relations. And uh, this is why we started to look at the knowledge graph because obviously uh, we need ontology first to be analyzed and uh, we need uh, actually um, to solve this ambiguation issues because one entity can be uh, can be coming from different uh, ontologies so uh, this is very important for this pipeline and uh, also it's uh, it's basically it's very slow because there are a lot of uh, computations so it can be done on the on cloud and uh, it should be started 
and after it will do like processing for let's say uh, 40 hours and after it should be stopped because it's very expensive to run cloud computations on Google Cloud even if Google actually donated credits to do that. So uh, we, we started to build this high quality knowledge graph and uh, what you should understand in, in this story uh, we have basically two different uh, communities. We have, we have bio biological community and they have uh, uh, one type of entities and uh, of course we have social economic uh, research, researchers so at some point we need to to uh, find some some kind of match how two knowledge graphs can be uh, merged together and uh, this is basically the challenge of uh, our work and uh, yeah for now we, we're just trying to do it with help of uh, uh, experts and i will show in further slides uh, the ideas uh, that we got so yeah Basically, we are, we are building bridges between communities by doing this work, and uh, of course, uh, uh, yeah, we, we want them to uh, learn something from each other. And uh, in, in like in, in real world, uh, in, in like three months ago, it was difficult to predict that people with uh, medical be uh, background will talk to computer science people or to uh, scientometrics people. But now it's happening. So now we, we need like kind of. Uh, open discussion about how to analyze all those papers and how to get new insights, how to find uh, some possibilities uh, to extract information about uh, available cures or to increase the chance to create vaccine. All these kind of discussions should be coming in one place and all people from all communities should be involved in this. So basically we need to find some comments here as well. And we decided to uh, deploy this tool. It's called Hypothesis, and Herbert was involved in, in this development uh, a few years ago. And uh, the ba uh, basically the idea that uh, all pipeline goes through uh, entities, and those entities will become uh, automatic annotations that will be visible in this tool. So basically, uh, Hypothesis can be seen as an extension uh, of browser, so people can just install it, activate they can get uh, account and after they just highlight can can just highlight uh, some uh, sentences in the document that they think not uh, corresponding to reality or they can may uh, they can also put some comments so basically they can uh, these human annotators human experts can validate results from machine learning uh, pipeline and uh, it's kind of nice collaboration between human and uh, machine so artificial intelligence. Another tool uh, that we are using, and it was a big surprise for me because uh, I thought, well, we already have annotation service, so why do we need uh, more? But eventually people uh, started to bring uh, other services and other, other tools, and uh, one of them uh, is called Decana, and it was developed in Japan. And basically uh, it's an open source text annotation tool for humans. This is how they actually uh, saw it in the beginning. And it allows to provide annotation uh, for uh, text classification and sequence labeling and sequence to sequence tasks. So basically for all natural language processing tasks. But in our specific case, we decided to reuse this tool in an unexpected way. So we started to build uh, uh, own annotations uh, with uh, help of artificial intelligence. And this is just example how it works. And it's when I saw this first time, I was really shocked because this is basically artificial intelligence that does uh, recognition of entities and does linkage to uh, some ontologies in, in the papers. And uh, the task of human just to uh, confirm that it was the right decision to uh, find this RNA pseudo node or something else in this text. So, to be honest, I think I think this is kind of future how it will work in in uh, in uh, humanity's future, and how uh, machine learning can actually support all these annotation tasks uh, in different communities. So now I'm coming to uh, biological expression language. So obviously we have some infrastructure, and now we need to understand the meaning, what we do. And uh, this uh, language actually allows uh, to curate, validate, and explore knowledge. And 
yeah, this is example in uh, Jupyter Notebook, and uh, we, we also have really uh, nice people inside of the, our community, and uh, one of guys, uh, Charles uh, Hoyt, he is actually a uh, maintainer of this bell, and uh, he's teaching and he's coaching people uh, how to join quickly his task and help him in all this biological uh, analysis. So here you can see how he analyzed some proteins and uh, uh, basically there is possibility also to uh, visualize graph with proteins. So there are a lot of interesting things that uh, this community is doing and it's just separate track in, in our uh, com uh, community, CoronaVite. Another tool that uh, is very important and it was developed by uh, Indra and it, it means uh, it, it's actually called uh, Integrated Network of Dynamical Reasoning and Assembler. So uh, it was funded by DARPA, by um, yeah, uh, military, <laughs> uh, defense, uh, military organization from the United States. So uh, this uh, tool actually uh, allows to extract uh, statements from any text. So we are just uh, getting triples out of this and the task of human in this case, just to confirm that it was the right statement and it's corresponding to reality because sometimes in papers, they can think like, okay, I suppose it can be something like that. So there is no, uh, like clear statement, there is still uh, some kind of probability that it can be wrong. So we're expecting uh, human experts to confirm that this statement was actually based on some data and we're also uh, using other tools to extract those da uh, data tables from papers. Uh, so Intra is very important component in, in our infrastructure. So Papa, this is how... Uh, how Papa, yes? If you wanted to allow some questions, you have about 10 minutes left. So okay, uh, can I just make finish a... quickly and uh, uh, respond to questions, if it's possible? Because I don't have too much slides ahead. Yes? Okay, so uh, this is how it looks in, in notebook with text analysis, and you can see uh, all words are connected somehow, but we don't know how, we don't know no relations. And this, using this pipeline, we actually get, can get those relations. And this is example uh, how knowledge graph actually looks like. So there is RDF with some data from uh, uh, Ministry of Health from Italy, and uh, it's available in our Sparkle endpoint, and our everybody can can query it and can get, can get this data to be connected to their uh, workflows. So our idea that we're building not only data infrastructure but also ontology engine and also AI powered literature review tool but the most important thing we are also building a discovery engine that allows actually to uh, rank and uh, annotate uh, all papers automatically. And next slide, just about ranking. So we did some work on altmetrics and uh, there is uh, information and data set I've already published on, on uh, Dataverse. So everybody can just download altmetrics like social engagement and uh, uh, downloads amount and other things, uh, citations uh, from this data set and can do uh, this analysis uh, in their own uh, Jupyter notebook. So this is just example how old metrics integrated in, in their workflow. Just few lines and they can get all available statistics uh, merged to their uh, data, data frame. And um, using this information, basically one of guys from India, he was able to, to uh, use machine learning, uh, to create machine learning model. And what he did was kind of amazing for us because he managed to uh, to link all affiliations from uh, COVID-19 papers collection and uh, the, uh, he created a data set for uh, most of papers where he put a, a location and uh, a grid ID and other information uh, about authors and other things. So this is just visualizations, uh, visualization, map visualization about Netherlands. Uh, you can see a lot of institutions in Amsterdam did something this uh, COVID-19 research before, and also in Utrecht. So uh, our plan is just to scale up this workflow and after to build service to get all affiliations uh, real time. 
So of course uh, there is some some kind of impact, uh, and I already told you that uh, we have a lot of people with different background, and uh, they're coming from a lot of countries and from all time zones. So sometimes uh, during discussions they're bringing like new ideas, and uh, we have all, already cases that actually after these discusses, uh, discussions uh, we've got like awards because a lot of people just can can bring different angles to the same problem. And uh, of course, uh, it's attracting like best people, best talents to join this community and also to do something against the uh, coronavirus. So basically, we are building kind of operating system for open science, and this infrastru infrastructure is uh, distributed and uh, I think uh, scaled uh, can can be scaled and reused for other tasks like cancer research in the future. And uh, it's completely built from open source components. And also, we are publishing data in Fairway with Dataverse, where all provenance information is also available and it's supported by our services, like Hypothesis. So, uh, the main challenge of this work is to get credibility from all communities, especially from medical community, because, of course, they don't trust uh, people uh, with computer science skills. They, you know, they, sometimes they think that uh, they do some, some kind of strange work this their data so this is how we can get credibility by reusing these services and we can get them involved in, in the evaluation of uh, our results so transparency of data and services uh, can guarantee the reproducibility of all experiments and this is really important for i think for uh, as a lesson for other uh, research infrastructures that, that uh, created here in europe on and also worldwide so we've got also some some kind of appreciation from uh, Vault uh, community, and this is page uh, published on on the website of uh, Semantic Score, and the coronavirus community is mentioned as one of the contributors to uh, COVID nineteen research, and also uh, it was uh, National Institutes of Health webinar uh, one month ago and uh, coronavirus got mentioned by Merce as one of examples uh, how people can collaborate nicely and to do something together. So uh, there are some references and I will share presentation and you can actually see and evaluate what we already created. So um, yeah, now I will come to questions. I, I, I hope I still have some time to do that. Okay, so uh, yeah, Andrea, can, can you moderate a little bit because I see... Uh, there were actually more pointers in the in the chat than 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 questions. There was one question of clarification, what what means comments, but I think that has been answered by now. Ingrid uh, sent uh, sent it uh, has sent you a link to the RDA uh, initiatives uh, she is involved in, and case uh, pointed mm -hmm. to the Dutch Tech Center for Life Science, which in a recent meeting discussed both coronavirus and the RDA activities. So there are mm -hmm. not so much questions by now, but maybe now questions will come in. Okay, so. Um... People, do you yeah. have any question, remarks, or are you still <laughs> digesting? Will you share the slides, Slava? Oh yeah, yes, uh, one second. Uh... <laughs> may may I, Andrea? Yeah, yes, of course, yeah. of course, case. Well, I mean, I mean, um, I'm also an insider, but Slava, I mean, have you have you had a look at some of the other initiatives, and can you indicate why, to in what to what extent your initiative uh, differs from all the other initiatives worldwide? Like, I saw a presentation on what's it called, the Vodon Network, Virus Outbreak Data Network, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so um, I mean, I for outsiders, it's, it's, yeah, okay, yeah. please go, yeah. I can immediately respond because uh, the idea of coronavirus is to have, it's, it's a kind of platform to have all discussions uh, where all communities that do something with coronavirus uh, uh, research, they can discuss things and also they can exchange knowledge. So I think uh, we're kind of global uh, and we're, we're trying to cover all questions. Okay. And of course, uh, other groups are more than welcome, and uh, we can share uh, 
channel on, on the Slack and they can see what's going on and what kind of uh, activities uh, we have. And sometimes even they, they can have people interested in, in work that they, they do. Marion, did you wanted to put a question? I saw your... Yeah, yeah, I... Uh, oh, uh, Slava, I, what I didn't understand was that uh, you use the Harvard data first for this or or is there another uh, instance? Or... No, it's a, first I started with Harvard data first. And after I've created another instance, uh, basically what we're developing in Shock Project. So it's deployed on uh, Google Cloud and uh, it's uh, it contains all previewers that we developed in, in Shock Project as well. But who is who is paying for this instance? Okay, so after we started this collaboration, uh, Google and Amazon and NASA and other organizations, they just came and they decided to fund this. So we have, uh, some money to run infrastructure. Uh -huh. and, and I have another question that's about uh, uh, privacy of the data. Is, is someone yeah. looking at the at, at a, a, a privacy aspect? Because, yeah, that yes. can be very... Uh... Yeah, so, so, um, yeah uh, a lot of people, they are interested in different things. And uh, of course, we have uh, some people that are interested to uh, collect all tweets <laughs> And uh, as information, uh, uh, these names. So basically, we are not allowing these to be published uh, as public data set. And uh, if something, yeah, we had uh, a few cases when people published, but uh, it was removed immediately by moderator because, of course, uh, you can break GDPR rules and uh, you can create a lot of troubles. So this kind of information is not allowed to expose in this uh, community. And I have one other question, but I don't know whether other people have questions. No, not overwhelmingly, no. <laughs> uh, so uh, my, 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 you, you said that sometimes uh, data were removed or, or that kind of thing, but if you do that in, yeah. in data search, it, it, it gets get a thumbstone. So the, 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 the repository, uh, uh, would have a, a mm -hmm. lot of uh, sandstones, I, I, I suppose. Okay, okay so uh, first of all, uh, this uh, instance of Dataverse is uh, it's also mentioned on the first page. It's very experimental, so it doesn't have any uh, persistency because uh, data site uh, only works with uh, like established uh, um, identities and coronavirus is just community, so it doesn't have any identity and uh, Basically, it's not possible to get any uh, PID for this kind of communities. So, so you work, yeah. So you work without pits. Yes, and after uh, it will be ready, uh, it will be transmitted. I mean, some data sets obviously will be kind of uh, complete and ready for archiving. So after they'll go to Harvard Dataverse, where okay. actually they have persistence. Yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. So, so people are also dropping out. They have to go to other meetings. But I, I would like to say that when Slava gave the presentation in two, uh, two and a half weeks ago, I think in the in the research group, we were we were very inspired and electrified. And 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 people said this is like an infrastructure, pop up infrastructure, or an infrastructure on the fly. So. So one of the idea of the work lunch is to also just share this kind of uh, these kind of initiatives, which work so differently than an infrastructure built by a network of institutions. So, uh, so I'm very pleased that also a lot of uh, developers could actually make free up time and, and join that. And I think Slava will send the link to the to the slides to dance all, so you can all consult them. They they live in a in a in a Google Drive. And I see that um, things are kind of, yeah, congratulating you to that. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. And uh, I hope it was interesting. <laughs> and I, I also noted, noticed that you made a lot of progress since, since the two and a half weeks before. So oh, yeah, especially, uh, especially these annotation tools. Uh, I, I even, uh, do, to be honest, I don't see any lim uh, limits now. 
yeah it's like no. the sky is the limit because it's uh, um, impossible to predict what actually people can create using this kind of infrastructure it can yeah. go in all directions in the same time and uh, i don't know it's really fascinating yeah okay thank you very much slava thanks to you all